Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the penultimate talk of the sessions of the talks for Cosmic Zoom. Uh, it's been an amazing ride so far. We have had uh, really interesting, really engaging talks from all parts of the world about pretty much everything in the universe. Uh, we've had talks about insects, like Professor Axel yesterday, uh, about uh, the formation of life, uh, about uh, subatomic particles, and pretty much everything that's under the sun, and some things which are above the sun as well. Uh, today, we'll be having a very, very fun talk uh, about mammals, which are in the ocean, which we know as cetaceans, but what are cetaceans? Cetaceans uh, have this really nice name called whales, but it's not just whales. There are lots of different types of cetaceans, and we have just a person to talk about it today. Uh, joining us all the way from Ahmedabad is ecologist Tipani. Uh, she is currently one second, please. Okay, she is an environmentalist and an uh, ecologist. Uh, who studies aquatic systems and megafauna, such as whales, dolphins, sharks, and rays in India. Uh, she's a senior research fellow at JCU Australia, a uh, member of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group, the Society of Marine Mammalogy International Affairs, and the IUCN Marine Mammal Protection Area Task Force. As an independent researcher, she advises MSc and PhD students in India and abroad. She is currently based in Ahmedabad and also teaches ecology to students of architecture, designing and planning at CEPT. Uh, caring for her nursery of native flora and her large family of non-human creatures keeps her grounded. Uh, I don't know who these non-human creatures are. If she's <laughs> taking care of dolphins and whales, I want in. But <laughs> let's find out from her. So, Dipani, it's all yours. Uh, you can take over. And then at the end of the session, or whenever you're comfortable, I will come in and moderate the question and answer session. So, good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, the entire team at Cosmic Zoom for inviting me to talk here. Um, and those non-human creatures, by the way, are 11 dogs and one cat. Used to be four cats. Now there's just one. Uh, so I'll start my talk now. I was I have to confess I was a little unsure about how much of information to add. So I did a bit of seriousness in the middle, um, in the starting, and then some fun stuff in the middle. And I hope you'll enjoy the talk. I'm just going to start it. Okay, so um, I have uh, been studying whales and dolphins for quite a while, I have to say, and when I started out back in 2001, uh, there was really nobody studying marine dolphins and whales, you know, there were people studying Ganges, Ganges River dolphins, as you might know, which is a different uh, group under aquatic mammals. Um, but as you see the photos here, and I'll, I'll take you through the slides, um, these are the four different main types of marine mammals. The left one is the dugong, then is the humpback dolphin, then are the walruses, and then are the baleen whales, okay? So this is just a general picture of the world that we are talking about. And we are talking about all kinds of waters, rivers, estuaries, lagoons, um, tropical seas, temperate seas, ice, ice packed seas, everything. They, they are everywhere. Um, next. So, before I go into the biology stuff, I always like to talk about culture. So this, this, this was a whole presentation I gave separately on the culture and the relationship between whales and men. And as uh, our friend said earlier, whales are not just whales, it's a misnomer. Whales are dolphins and whales. Uh, as you see, the relationship with humans is a pretty old one. Um, out here, you can see Inuit art. You can see that whale, uh, that sperm whale bone that has been carved into art. You can see Inuits in northern Canada and Alaska hunting. The community will hunt just one whale a season so that the entire village can eat. Uh, it's not a commercial uh, fishery. Then you'll have people like Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd getting rid of uh, whalers, Japanese whalers on the left. You have the American Army, the Navy trying to train dolphins so that they can go and spy on other um, submarines and enemy vessels. Then you have tourism, like this girl with the two dolphins over here. 
And then you have researchers like us who just want to observe animals, study them, figure out their ecology, figure out their evolution, and why they're important in the planetary system and the Earth ecosystem. So we look at every little scale, and they're, they're, my, they're part of our culture at every human consciousness level, almost. Um, so uh, that is something that we always have to keep in mind, that we don't only have to have a conservationist outlook when we're studying uh, marine mammals, at least we don't. Now doing a bit of that boring stuff, uh, some taxonomists of course here will be interested, uh, but they're divided into uh, three orders, Cetacea, Sirenia, and Carnivora. Cetaceans are your baleen whales, your dolphins, and your porpoises. So dolphins basically are toothed whales and porpoises. They have teeth. Uh, dolphins have conical teeth and porpoises have square teeth. While Mr. Seeds have baleen. So baleen plates on the side of the large whales that you see, they are basically keratin. Um, these fall under cetacea. Then there's dugongs. I don't know if any of you have seen them either in Andaman Nicobar Islands or in the Gulf of Kutch or Gulf of Manar or even in Australia or Abu Dhabi. Large uh, herds of dugongs they're called. They're also called sea cows, the herbivores. And then there's, of course, carnivoras under which there is polar bears, and then there is the pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, and walruses. These pinnipeds we do not have in our waters. Uh, we only have, we don't have otters, um, marine otters, right? We have smooth coated otters and freshwater, basically freshwater otters. Uh, so they are, are a different group altogether. And if you look at the evolution, what is really amazing is probably, probably this, I'll go to the next slide and then you'll understand more. Why did land mammals, these are land mammals that went back to sea. Why? Probably there was a scarcity of food or there was huge predators that they could not deal with. Uh, so there was this convergent evolution suddenly 50 to 55 million years ago, where different groups of land mammals, as you will see in that figure there, different groups of land mammals, um, all related to the hippopotamus, started going back to sea, okay? So uh, these uh, related, pinnipeds were related to weasels, skunks, otters. There are two different groups over there for the pinnipeds. And cetaceans and sirenians, there used to be a time where, you know, sirenians are just grass-eating mammals. They're not related to the carnivora kind of animals at all. So there were different groups of animal, mam land mammals in different parts of the world that started going into sea because there was food there. Um, so that's how we think they all evolved, but there were different groups of land mammals. Um, so worldwide, there are probably about 130 to 133 species of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and seals, and sea lions, and dugongs, and manatees. And in India, we have probably 30 to 31 of these species. Um, if you ever get the chance, uh, or maybe I should show you the... Huh. So based on whatever little work we have done in India till now, only in the past 20, 21 years, and most of it in the last seven or eight years, we've managed to even be on the important marine mammal areas of the world, the Atlas. Uh, this is a website you can, uh, shape files can be downloaded. Um, and basically the yellow areas are the confirmed important marine mammal areas. And the blue ones are the ones that want to become important marine mammal areas, but don't still have enough information. The criteria for these things is all online. You can check the, check the website for that. Um, this is a poster of all the different species that have had confirmed sightings and reports from our waters. When I mean our waters, it's the Indian subcontinent. So Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal. And this poster, I, I put it up especially to show you about how as they evolved, they actually started arranging themselves across the habitat. You go from a sh from the shore and you go closer to outer, outer to deeper habitats, into more complex bathymetry, and the species change. The species complex changes. Uh, closer to shore on your left, you have humpback dolphins, finless porpoises, irabati dolphins, and the dugong. And then you go further, and this is real. Like we, when we do surveys, we do not see humpback dolphins and finless porpoises together in sympatry, but they use the same space. But yet, humpback dolphins are closer to shore, finless porpoises are a bit further out. Irabadi dolphins are closer to shore, but they do not hang out with humpback dolphins because humpback dolphins chase them away. And dugongs, of course, are in seagrass beds. 
you go a bit further out, you have bottlenose dolphins. You go a bit further out from there, and you will have your spinner dolphins, your spotted dolphins, if you're in reef areas or in deep ocean. So I'm not going to explain the entire thing, of course, but there is a stratification in the way these mammals have evolved and distributed themselves across this water expanse of water. Okay, so so there's these adaptations, of course, and do check out the website that we have created. It's an open source database. Anybody can download, upload data they want to for their particular areas. Um, how, why did they evolve in this way? Basic stuff. It's the same stuff for just about any other evolutionary theory. There needs to be uh, safety from predators. There needs to be mating success. And all these things need to be together in that particular habitat. Hmm. So these are the, just the basic tenets of uh, why the species may have evolved over time in different habitats and why they separate themselves over space and time. And for these, there was physiological and anatomical adaptations and behavioral adaptations. So physiologically, these are warm blooded animals like us. They need to maintain their body temperature, right? So they need to thermoregulate. So they have adapted uh, their uh, circulatory systems in such a way that warm blood from outside goes inside or goes out and heats up the outside cooler parts of their body. Diving, they don't get bends, they don't get nitrogen narcosis, right? Uh, they can deep dive a thousand meters like two bears whales and beak whales and sperm whales. They're deep diving. They, they exhale, they exhale and they go down. And when they go down, their lungs can actually collapse. So they don't have issues like we do. Locomotion, they become streamlined, like they're, uh, they, they've lost their hands, they've lost their legs, their fingers is all that you, these digits are all that you can see in their flippers, so that there is no friction when they're moving, they can just zoom through in the water. Sound is one of the most beautiful ones, which we'll talk more uh, later, and then there is vision. So all these things physiologically, anatomically have changed in the body over time so that they can all, all these convergent groups of mammals had all these uh, changes in their bodies so that they could live underwater, give birth underwater and eat underwater. Okay, those are the three reasons why they are called marine mammals. Some of them like walruses, they are outside water, outside land, only outside water just to give birth, but otherwise the rest is outside, inside water. Uh, the fins and the flippers exist instead of the legs. The nose has moved up so that they can stay outside water when they're breathing. They have to breathe. Different dolphins and different whales have different um, breathing intervals, interbreathing intervals. It depends on their body size. Um, so these are just some of the changes that have happened biologically. I'm not going to go into the detail of each of these. We can have that in question and answers or you can always read up um, later. Uh, behavioral adaptations is something I'm very interested in, you know. So these mammals um, went back to sea and they started using sound as a way of communication because of course water is a very dense medium compared to air. You cannot just see up beyond a few meters, you cannot see, right? So they had to find a new way of communicating uh, not, and navigating. Um, so, so they developed their ability to use sound like the way bats have used to use sonar. Uh, there is variations in social structures. These are animals that are similar in brain size to us almost. And uh, so they are cognitively well-developed. They are socially complex. Uh, they have different reproductive strategies. They have different foraging strategies. So there is learning, there is language, and there's culture. And this has been studied most, not in all species, sadly, but mainly in killer whales, in sperm whales, and in bottlenose dolphins, and in humpback whales. Um, um, and beyond that, some of the more common species that you might see if you go ha have a chance to go out into our waters are your Ganges River dolphin, Irrawaddy dolphin, finless turquoise, humpback dolphin, bottlenose dolphin, and tropical spotted dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, and that's the blue reese whale down there. But from all of this, I, as I said, will concentrate a bit more on the project that I'm currently doing and therefore I'm most uh, informed about right now. Uh, and that is the Arabian Sea Humpback Whale Project. And, the, and this project is a large one and it has involved so many people and so many places and I'm thankful for all of them for making um, this actually uh, succeed. So going back to um, humpback whales, uh, most of you have probably 
probably seen humpback whales either off the northeast coast of um, of America or off the coast of Africa, South Africa. Uh, but we have them here. We have them right here in the Arabian Sea along the west coast of India. And uh, we had large numbers, of course, before um, before the whaling happened. So post World War II, the Japanese were not allowed to go fish or hunt anymore in the sea. So the Russians came about catching whales for them and providing the food to them. And they did a lot of hunting in our waters. All those little yellow dots that you see in the water of Gujarat and Pakistan are the humpback whales that they hunted those days. And so we lost a large number of our uh, animals that time. So what is so special about Arabian Sea humpback whales? It's a very, as you know, most people think that whales are migratory, that all whale population move between the te temperate and the tropics, right? But it's not, the, it's not the case with the Arabian Sea humpback whales, and probably also not for the blue whales in the Arabian Sea. Of course, it's because the Arabian Sea is highly productive and it's warm, there is no need for the animals to move out, right? Um, but it's a very small population and it's genetically isolated from other humpback whale populations. They found this out already because the people in Oman have been studying them for the past 20 years. Also, because they don't move out and don't mingle with other foreign uh, humpback whales, they don't, their songs don't seem to change much within the population, which is a good thing for us. People like me who are trying to find one or two or three humpback whales, it's easier to compare the song because the variability is low. Um, what a humpback whale is, song is made of, I will show you a bit later after you hear a, a bit from Indian waters. So when I started out in 2017, the first job was to try and find out where these whales are hanging out, not by spending a lakh of rupees a day, uh, uh, you know, doing surveys and looking for a needle in a haystack kind of. Uh, I started doing interviews and every state I went to, I had local partners and you know, hosts who, whose houses I could stay at, fishermen families who I spent time with. Uh, and so I started interviewing people from Northern Gujarat from the border of India and Pakistan all the way till Kanyakumari. And uh, to identify and map hotspots of humpback whale presence. And after that, it started, we, we built a participatory network of informants based on this process. You train local scientists or local NGOs. And then the final step was to do the humpback whale song comparison rather than to go out on the boat and do vessel based surveys that one can easily do for other situations that are common. So, as I said, the key stored stakeholders were fishing community members, uh, vessel crews like Coast Guard vessel or any other uh, shipping vessels. And of course, there was naturalists, researchers, and tourism operators that also provided. Uh, and uh, methods, yeah, I, I covered this. We did interview surveys, we did presentations, we did workshops, and we did um, all kind of uh, ways of reaching out to the local people. Um, there is a map here that shows you that we started off just with data in Maharashtra. And then now, of course, we are uh, behind in that. Just to give you some glimpses of the kind of information I used to get from people. Uh, this is Dwarka. It's a lovely little fishing village, uh, fishing town now in northern Gujarat. And uh, a humpback whale, live humpback whale, had stranded here. So I had gone to the spot because I'd given them all this workshop a few days earlier. Um, sadly, though, uh, they did not release this uh, live humpback whale because, release in the sense, they did not just let it peacefully die because they consider, I'll tell you later, they consider large whales, fishermen consider large whales to be a blessing from God. And in Gujarat, uh, the Hindu fishermen call them the um, Masa, um, and the Muslim fishermen call them Macharaja, you know, king of, king of all fish. So they all revere them. And this is a temple, this is a whale temple in Gujarat uh, near Baruch actually, where the, sheep, the whale is considered basically and that uh, was a very, those are people I'm interviewing. Uh, and so from moving just from Maharashtra, we had, found, we found all these different areas where fishermen told us that yes, these animals do come here. They come during a particular time of the year. 
and uh, this is what they eat and this is how they behave so this is the kind of data sets we were at, we've actually depended on uh, till we could boil down to um, to certain hotspots the other thing we also did was we had network informants all along so we could monitor the number of the kinds of whales that were getting stranded stranded is in dead animals um washing being washed ashore and we found that the mortalities were pretty high in certain times of the year or certain years I'm not sure why for that but uh, but we found humpback whale mortalities even in even in this uh, database so as I said, the fishermen both revere and fear baleen whales. When they're out fishing, if they see a baleen whale, they will change their course. They will not continue fishing in that. They will break a coconut like light and incense stick uh, and then move on. Um, so Machcha Babu, Machcha Raja, Deva Masa, Deva Rameen, Ayyappa, Mithimingalam, Kadalanna, Timingala, Piriameen, Kadalanna. These are all the different uh, Terms that uh, fishermen use for the large baleen whales. Uh, now, coming to the database that I am working on, or the data I am working on, you know, we built quite a bit in the last three years. Earlier, we just had uh, newspaper records or something like that. Uh, but as you will see um, from the visuals, the next visuals, this is all we had when we when I started out. One newspaper clipping from Kanyakumari. Uh, where a coast guard, uh, the captain of the coast guards actually in Gandhinagar gave me this clipping saying, no, no, we have them here too, you know, in the south, it's not just in Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra, as you're saying, we also have them south. So that's how I expanded my research area, all the way till Kanyakumari. Uh, this is uh, Gujarat 2006, the Indian coast guard vessel, they saw three humpback whales and they took photos. Um, and we actually use, as you see on the top left, that is the lower portion of the tail. And that is what we use to match IDs also, if we do photo identification based population estimation. Like we do for tigers, the same way we do for dolphins and whales. Uh, we use marked and unmarked individuals to estimate population size. Uh, this is again from Gujarat, where a humpback whale that had got entangled in a fishing gear is being released uh, from the net. Uh, this is thanks to WTI because they had trained a lot of uh, people to release even whale sharks from fishing nets. So this was another piece of proof from Gujarat that time. And here is a little whale song. This is very recent. This is started in 2017. Uh, and uh, divers were just diving off Grand Island and they started hearing a whale song. So luckily they had a video camera and you might you'll be able to uh, hear this. And just look at the graph in the meantime, when you hear, because you'll be able to match that audiogram with what you're hearing, okay? That last bit is that long thing there, and this is just one unit in a phrase yeah. in one thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they're, they're funny, funny creatures, uh, male humpback whales. So this was our first time where we actually, as researchers, got humpback whale song recording um, off the coast of the mainland coast of India. Kerala had, um, you know, the NIOT and Chennai. Uh, they had some defense uh, boya, defense hydrophone off Kerala, and they had recorded a song which they also published in 2017-18. Uh, but they had recorded that song in 2015. So our earliest humpback whale song from India is 2015. And then, then was this one. I'm not going to go through the entire song because it's very funny, it makes me laugh. Uh, then was this sighting in 2017, this uh, live stranding, as I already told you, uh, in 2017 in Gujarat. This has nothing to do with the song, but I'm going to play this video because I you can see the eye of the humpback whale moving. And it was just it it was just too much because uh, they were insisting on pulling this animal back to sea, 
while it should have just been allowed to die uh, gently and easily. Uh, the weight of the animal, you can imagine when it has stranded on sea, on land, it just cannot be dragged around. It just has to, you just have to let it be. But on the other hand, or the Una is, if you know Una, it's, in, it's been in the news for lots of other reasons. But all community members were around there. All religions were around there. All castes were around there. Ladies were burning incense sticks and putting garlands, and the men were preparing to take the whale back to sea. They did that, but of course. <laughs> But of course, it did not survive and it washed back to shore dead the next day. Now, there was a little exciting bit also. So, the next bit in my journey was about the satellite tag whale that came from Oman. They Um, are we, did we just lose her? Yes, uh, apologies for that. I think Dipani is having uh, technical issues. Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think she left her things. You know, she was saying she was having internet issues. I was, that was the exciting bit that was coming about. Oh, she's back. She's back. Uh, Dipani, you are mute. Hold on. I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry. Yeah. So you were on the slide of Luban and you were just about to start on the adventures of Luban. Okay. I'm getting back there. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yep. You can see her traveling all the way across the Arabian Sea. Uh, she reached India uh, in December, mid December, went down. For New Year's to Kanyakumari, and then she stayed there for three months before Luban went back uh, all the way back to where she came from by late March. So, this was our first proof um, of the fact that the Arabian Sea humpback whale population does share India, in, India and the Oman continental shelf. Uh, we knew that they're probably there up in Pakistan and India, up there also, that border. We did not know about this bit. This came as a surprise and um, it, was a, it was a fun surprise. I was down there in Kerala that time looking for her on the Indian Coast Guard uh, mothership. Everybody was excited because it was New Year and we had a humpback whale. So uh, this was the second piece of adventure that we had. And after that, it's just not stopped. So this is something, this is fishermen providing me. In yeah. So now when they're out, with this humpback whale, they record these kind of things for us. There were two whales. There were two whales at this sighting that people had off the coast of Virabal, or again in Saurashtra. And uh, for all you people who uh, speak Tamil, understand Tamil, this was an interview of a fisherman in Kanyakumari explaining his observations. Ah, the meaning of the is the meaning. This is the meaning of the meaning. This is the the meaning. This is the meaning of the meaning. This is so, 
uh, may I have the yeah. pleasure of translating for the general public? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, what the uh, fisherman said was, "This is a giant fish, or uh, this is a whale," and it, and then he made the noise, the whale song, and then he said, "We don't disturb it." Uh, because if we were to disturb it, it would disturb the work we do. So whenever we see it, we just silently go off in the opposite direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, we have now, by, by now, we already have the hotspots in place. We know that the humpback whales um, at particular times of the year are found in central Karnataka, in uh, northern Gujarat, uh, and somewhere between Kerala and Kanyakumari. These three for sure uh, are locations where um, we know that they come. So this was some other proof. This was uh, actual sighting and song together. Uh, as you'll see, it's a GIF. It's just a GIF, but that's the animal. Okay. And the next song, next bit is uh, the same time. The same time there were free divers in the water. Can you imagine how lucky these people are? And if you can just take a few seconds, wait for the person to go down and you'll be able to hear the sound also. There you go. So uh, this individual that we are listening to, that we saw, we also managed to get a video of him underwater and we identified him as Timmy. Well, Timmy is not his real name, he's just, uh, uh, we've given him a pet name. But this was an individual that was last seen in Oman waters in 2001. Uh, he is highly damaged, his one part of his tail fluke is missing. And he has been hanging around in our waters since 2017. Because we have, we have this song in 2017, in 2018, 2019, 20 also. So now we have two confirmed um, whales from the Oman catalog. One was Oman, or one was Luban, and one is Tiki. Um, and after this, um, we have started the last component of our work, which is putting these sound recorders in the water in the three hotspots. Uh, this is a hydrophone unit. Sadly, it is made in New Zealand and it's a huge, huge, huge problem of getting all these things into the country, but we've managed because of the government, because of government funds. Um, it is a sound trap. Uh, it's called Sound Trap uh, by Ocean Instruments, dot New Zealand. And uh, they can, these, these really, it's half a kg, that hydrophone that you see over there. So we have to find a spot which will, which uh, is free of fishing nets, and uh, you can record depending on how, what frequency range you want to record, and how often in an hour, uh, it can stay down there for three months at a time, and then you take it, bring it back, you download the data, and you analyze it, and you look for the humpback whale song amongst all the other noise that you get from the from underwater sounds. There's fish chattering, the shrimps, shrimps making noise, there are fishing boats. And there are the dolphins that are chattering away to each other. So it's a lot of post-processing work actually, rather than the initial logistics that goes into this. But this is the one in Karnataka, this hydrophone unit. And then the next one we just succeeded in putting is off the coast of Kerala. And this is at a much deeper uh, 40, 37 meters uh, underwater. So we are hoping that both these hydrophones are recording just now and that we get something. Uh, though the year has not been that nice to us, uh, we managed to put these units only after the known humpback whale season was over. But we'll see what we get. Uh, so um, this is just to give you a quick understanding about how humpback whale song is. I mean, how it evolved is altogether another, <laughs> another thing. But it consists of four to seven themes, four to six themes. And each theme is made of a 
phrase, number of phrases together. Okay? So these units, as you see, is each unit is consisting of a phrase and each theme uh, has a number of different phrases. Um, and that's how we have to go through those audiograms, look at the repetitions and the patterns so that we know how many themes this individual has, individual has and whether it matches with the themes and the phrases from across from the Oman uh, individuals. If they don't, then we have to look for the catalog of the Northern Indian Ocean humpback whales, which is a different population of humpback whales. Um, so what other species though? That was my humpback dolphin talk, because I just, that's what I'm doing just now. What I did earlier, what a lot of uh, the students right now are studying are other species, not as charismatic as humpback whales. Um, and those are Indian Ocean humpback dolphins, what you see off the coast of Goa, if you've seen dolphins there. Uh, Indo-Pacific finless porpoise is not easy to sight, uh, but quite common along our coast. And Iravadi dolphins, if you go to Chilka. So a lot of these, only these species have been studied using your usual wildlife methods of population estimation, which is uh, distance sampling, photo identification, and the now passive acoustic monitoring. So because I'm talking about sound, I, five minutes, five minutes. Because I'm talking about sound, I'll just show you uh, these are the three species, that's Kiravari dolphins on the right, humpback dolphins on the top left, and that's Pindus porpoise on the top, on the bottom left. Um, and this is what I mean by photo identification. So these are all different individual Kiravari dolphins. And as you can see, they all have different marks, and we can use these marks to look at their site fidelity, their home ranges, their population sizes, and who they hang out with, you know? So in Iravadi dolphins, if you go to Chilka, there are certain animals that always hang out with each other. There are male groups of dolphins and male and female separate, uh, females and calves separate. So you can use marked information like this to study dolphin populations and whale populations. Kilo whales are studied like this. Um, pilot whales are studied like this. Bottlenose dolphins are studied like this. And then of course, there's a passive acoustic monitoring that we started a few years ago. This is another sound recording device. You cannot see the species from this device. You can only see the presence and absence of certain species. So this is a seaport from the UK and it recorded the clicks of the finless porpoises and the whistles and the clicks of the humpback dolphins. And some very simple data, but neat data that came out of it. So we have two seaports uh, sea placed off the coast of Maharashtra. And this is what we get, right? Uh, this one has, this area has more humpback dolphin presence and this area has more Pindus porpoise presence. I'm not going to go into the details of the time right now, but as I said, these two species occupy the same area, but at different times. And that's what's showing up over here. Um, Echolocation activity uh, is mainly, uh, I don't know if I have the time to explain this, but clicks are usually for, echo, for navigation and for searching for food. Uh, in these water, in, in water bodies. So uh, finless purpose is clicks and versus time of the day, we wanted to know when they are more active, the night time or daytime. And Isha Bopadika, a student of mine who is now at ISA Tirupati with, uh, uh, with the bird lab there, she is taking this up for her PhD where she's looking at using passive acoustic monitoring to look at density estimation of these two different species. Um, and of course, you get insights into behavior. These are whistles, these shape, these things that you see during socializing, that is when they use whistles the most uh, to communicate with each other. It might be pre years uh, next. Oh, yeah. So these are Iravadi dolphin whistles. You will be able to see them. There are different types. There's a simple straight one, a slightly complicated one, a, sh a, a, a shaped one. So just hear them. So once we download data, we have to characterize the sounds um, to figure out how many different kinds of whistles uh, the particular species is exhibiting. And these are the other kinds of sounds, burst pulses and quick trains, most likely again for social functions of communicating with each other. Yeah. That's the click train and that was the first first pulse. So this was the Iravadi dolphins. Now this is the effect of uh, tourism or fishing vessels. 
this is iravadi dolphins tourism in chilka we were trying to figure out if their communication vessels were being masked by boat noise uh, and they kind of are you can hear the boat noise and the whistles yes. so you can see that the boat noise is really masking uh, the whistles there uh, which is probably not a great thing at all when it comes when when the only thing they have underwater to keep in touch with each other is communicate is sound and finally talking about the threats that these animals face worldwide and india is consumption for meat oil skins and non consumption is eco tourism public display in captivity um and usually live animal handling for research uh, indirect threats which are more common fisheries entanglement climate change related changes naval exercises as i said the deep, deep diving waves uh, whales and dolphins get really affected by sonar naval sonar and seismic surveys for oil and then there's dams ports and effluents and ship strikes for the large whales so there are different fields of study where in india we have not even started most of them we don't have any information on life history on spatial ecology on uh, yeah population abundance as i said probably one of these species only from the 30 to 31 um standing response networks have started but they don't collect the data we need for life history um natural history ecology behavioral ecology very little stuff so we have just about started and we need a lot more work we probably need an institution uh, to set the ball rolling so just wanted to thank people uh, i cannot thank all of them but uh, there are certainly organizations and institutions and uh, groups of people that have been part of all the work i did and uh, please visit our website it's called marinemammals.in and all of us who are now studying marine mammals um, both in rivers and in the sea aquatic mammals what i call them we are all listed there so people i uh, urge people to actually get in touch and go out on the water and study these uh, highly social complex uh, animals and that is it for now um i will be happy uh to take questions on when i'm in the car or however or i think these people have a surprise for you all actually waiting i am going to they're going to play something uh, fun <laughs> so uh while i offload and um, get into the car before the police stop me uh before i get home but yeah i think i'll hand over to you now and uh, yeah uh, the, quickly before other people realize what's going on it's she said she might be stopped by the police due to curfew it's not like that she curfew curfew <laughs> <laughs> we have to put that in context right now <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> yeah it's not like she's being arrested uh, she is going home not yet <laughs> okay cool thank thank you dipani um, there are no few worries. questions uh so dipani you can stop share and by the way i love the reference to douglas adams i'm so happy uh, and uh, to, to those people who were wondering what's happening that's a dolphin with a puffer fish okay and this is really not interesting sorry it's not a puffer fish it's a scat scat it's a scat ah it's a scat okay so so and in in uh, douglas adams all the dolphins suddenly disappear and say thanks for all the fish so nice yeah. dolphins Had enough of, had enough of us. Okay, I'm just going to sign in on Zoom in two minutes, um, okay. and uh, on the phone. Sorry, yeah, yeah. and then I'll yeah, see sure. you all later. There are a few yeah. questions, okay. and I'll be able to answer them as well. But then I'll wait for you to come back, and I'll have the surprise up now for other people. So, see you. Thank you. Minutes online. Uh, you can leave yes. now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. to everybody else who is listening i do have a surprise for you um so there are a few questions about whale songs right and if you remember she was talking about how the humpback whale in arabian sea is from 80 hertz to 100 hertz now blue whales are around 10 to 39 hertz and humpback whales the, uh, the, the fin whales are from uh, 20 to 40 hertz that's the hertz at which they do now these are the hertz which the frequency at which these specific whales or the breed of whales or the species of whales uh communicate with now in the early 2000s 2004 2005 uh there was a certain one individual whale 
that they discovered which was vocalizing at 52 hertz now 52 hertz is a very it's a very different frequency which does not match any of the world whale population so there are lots of stories as to what happened uh, is this because of a mutation or is this because of some problem is it because of some uh, a, a dysfunction or something like that but the whale was alive is still alive until today it is still vocalizing but it's become a little older it's more mature so it's become 48 47 hertz but it's still a different hertz by itself and because it's on a different hertz the it's not able to communicate with its own kind now the, here's a problem what is its own kind is it a blue whale or is it a fin whale or is it one of those rare hybrids of a blue whale and a fin whale we don't know so this is the story of something called the world's loneliest whale it's called the world's loneliest whale because one we have always discovered it as being as an independent whale by itself and two because it's unable to find a matching echo to its songs it's unable to find its herd or a partner now this is a very sad i would say story but the surprise i have for you is a song from a band which i am a big fan of who did a song called valian 52 which is about the world's loneliest way so i'm going to play that video right now okay it's by a really good korean pop man called bts okay so i want to share that with you now it's called valian 52 uh, it's an actual song they have not uh you know i have not done any difference to it it this is exactly as it was made so let me know wait hold on i have to sh share with audio share sound yes anupam uh, gopi let me know if you can hear it clearly if the volume is too high too less let me yeah. maximize video so that everybody can see it and it's got the lyrics also so you can follow along remember they're talking about a whale that has a different frequency of its own ladies and gentlemen bts Lonely creature in the world. Oh yeah. You want to know my story? Yeah. I never told this to anybody. Yeah. Come on.
내가 부르다 하셨어 멀 힘껏 네 목소리 내라 하셨어 그런데 어떡하죠 여긴 너무 깜깜하고 온통 다른 말을 하는 다른 고래들 뿐인데 아시게 모르고 사랑한다 말하고 싶어 혼자는 돌린 노래 같은 악보를 왜 짚어 이 바다 너무 깊어 그래도 나 다행인 걸 I'm a really young man 생각할 거야. 저기 지구 반대편 가지자. No more, no more, baby, no more, no more. 눈먼 곳에도 좋지. 난볼수 있을 거야. 오늘도 다시 노래하지 마. There you go. Now I also happen to have the actual uh, herds. Recording of the whale. Let's see. Share sound. So, um, this is a blue whale. And this is a fin whale. And this is the 52 hertz wheel. Hmm. As you can see, there is a distinct difference. By the way, I think Dipani is back. Uh, Isaacus, can you make her a co-host? Oh, by the way, I should have given you uh, explicit lyrics <laughs> uh, warning about that. Completely forgot, yes. Um, yes, so there are a couple of other songs. There's a country song also, but this is the most famous song about the world's loneliest whale, which sings at 52 hertz. Yes, if, uh, Dip if Dipani is back and we can get her on audio, let's ask her some questions. Yep, she's a co-host now. Hi, everyone. I have Are to talk to a car? mask, though. Yes, I'm in the car, but with a mask on. <laughs> you're, you're clear. That's more important. You're clear. And you have escaped the cops, so it's good. <laughs> so, Dipani, I'll just ask you the questions that have been put forward. Yeah. And if you can, uh, you yeah. can answer them. Uh, I'll also, I am, I am also, uh, you know, if, if you need some time or something like that, I'll be more than happy. To okay. Yeah. Uh, the first question is uh, from Venkat Kartikeyan. Uh, he asks, uh, which breeds of whales live in the Indian Ocean? Okay, I guess what he means is which species of uh, whales. whales live in the Indian Ocean. I'm sorry, I think I probably went through the presentation really fast, but... Uh, so when you talk about whales, if you're talking about the baleen whales, so then uh, these are the bl blue whale, humpback whales, broody's whale, omura's whale. And we may or may not have uh, the sai whales and the minke whales. We do not know. We have no confirmed sightings as yet of those two species. And if you're talking about the toothed whales, which are the dolphins, which basically have teeth, uh, then there are at least, if you look at the poster there, other than these four and the dugong, everything else, are the dolphins, are the two whales. Uh, so about 26 species of uh, small and big sized dolphins. And the largest would be the sperm whale, and after which is the killer whale, and then the smallest would be uh, your finless porpoise and your, and your Ganges River dolphin. A uh, quick question. You said sperm whale and killer whale, and these are in the Indian Ocean? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, fantastic. of course. Oh. We have beautiful records of uh, killer whales. So the, the killer whales are known as the wolves of the sea, as you know, yeah. uh, and they are cosmopolitan. So they are roaming the oceans and we have an online catalog of matching fins across the tropics. 
and we have killer whales in india that are also found in sri lanka and also found in the middle east so these are the same individuals roaming around and we in lakshadweep we recently had a sighting of a male adult a female adult and a calf you know wow um, yeah so uh, very interesting social structures killer whales have yeah and i have to say one more thing about killer whales is they are highly highly intelligent in the sense that i'm scared of them like i would be scared <laughs> of water nosed dolphins they are very clever yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. they have actually off the coast of seattle uh, they have actually segregated themselves into fish eating killer whales and dolphin eating killer whales so that they don't compete with each other over food so uh, that's how advanced they are in their in their cognitive ability uh let me add just a couple of things to uh, what dipani said because i too am a fan of killer whales um so by the first of all they are killer whales is a misnomer uh, they are porpoises as she pointed out uh, it comes from a spanish mistranslation uh, it was usually known as asininas balenas uh, which in spanish means killer of whales because they were the the ones who were killing all the whales and when it got translated in english it became uh, asininas became killer and balenas balenas became whale and became killer whales but technically spanish should be translated the other way around so it should have been whale killer but it was a mistake and the etymologically mistake it came on became killer whales that's one two there is fantastic video which my grandmother and i enjoy of this uh, mother killer whale uh, teaching its two calves how to hunt seals so what it does is there's this poor seal which is sitting on an ice floe okay and the mother brings its two calves makes it wait and say okay guys watch what i'm going to do and it they they play she places the calves so they can see everything and then it creates a wave so that the wave of water washes over the ice floe knocks the seal down then the mother killer whale goes around picks up the seal shows it to the calf this is how you do it puts the poor seal back on the ice floe and tells the calf wait i'm going to do it again now watch properly goes around again creates a wave knocks the seal off puts it back on the ice floe and say okay guys now you do it and i'm like poor seal i mean like what trauma is the seal going through yeah like not... tell you it's true. it's real real fear and, and the worst part is they are not hungry so they leave the seal and they just go they don't even Fun. eat the seal this the seal is like bro like why what did i do yeah so the, the, yeah. the, the videos on youtube you can find it out uh so yeah. that's one okay next question um yes from casper abij uh, from <laughs> YouTube it is known that whales encode an enormous amount of information onto their songs did we get any step towards decoding these or other communications uh i think what he means is whether we know um what it stands for or what it represents behaviorally is that what the, i think that might be the question uh or or what that or what information the song might have of the environment probably Uh, so no we just about started out but like i can tell you something very simple uh, let's say i'm in the boat i'm listening to irabadi dolphins talk to each other which is basically whistles um or let's say there is a dolphin and suddenly a killer whale is coming around uh so what happens is suddenly the whistles change suddenly there is a different kind of whistle happening a uh, different uh, the, the, basically the animals are now communicating with each other differently and saying let's get back together again there is a problem around here okay so that in those kind of cases yes we are being able to decode what it might mean otherwise we are just starting out with our sound analysis in relation to behavior because as you know these animals half the time are under water we don't really know what they're doing uh, so unless there is a camera looking at them doing something and then there is real time sound in relation to that and there's enough sample size for us to put these bits and pieces together um it's difficult but as i said i gave that little example um of decoding the information okay is that uh, is that what yeah I, I, yes yes i think it's pretty much yes uh then we have a question from krishna <laughs> sharma from youtube uh why were the whale species no longer amphibians when the ice age was going on interesting oh dear dear lord <laughs> that, that, okay so may, may i step in so this is more yes, evolution please. Yeah. yes please so uh krishna this is more evolution and in evolution there's no question of why it's literally just happened uh but yes uh so the 
if i am not wrong the ice age was quite recent i mean technically in the entire history of uh, evolution it was the ice age is relatively uh, recent and it does not technically affect the difference in our amphibians and reptiles and the evolutionary system of animals that is because of the extinction events that happens uh, this is on a different talk hopefully this will be uh, something that is addressed tomorrow where we talk about from big bang to now the entire time scale of the universe so save this question for tomorrow and you can join us and we'll probably get deeper into that thank you uh, we have another question uh, from zenith two questions actually uh, mm. how whales are important for oxygen production i don't know how you can answer mm. that and do whales and dolphins taste food interesting yes 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 okay so the first question i think maybe what she is trying to say is ask is what is the role of whales in the trophic system probably in in the nitrogen cycle or the, or the water cycle or whatever so the way i explain why are whales important to the marine ecosystem right it's literally their poop it is literally their dead bodies okay coral reefs are formed around whales that have they are have died and have sunk to the bottom of the sea huge coral reefs uh, the productivity that powered by whale poop is probably uh, leads to the highest productive regions fisheries regions in the world so uh, this is a very simple answer but it is the answer that uh, they are part of the nutri uh, nutrient cycle in the sea in the oceans um, not directed not directly into oxygen production i don't think there is anything like that really but uh, there is decomposition that leads to productivity that leads to a richer ocean and its ability to absorb carbon uh, and the second question i think was about what was it sorry i forgot uh, what was the dolphins taste food ah uh, i think so we don't know they do have adaptations for taste and they do seem to have a preference for fish you know different species have a different uh, prey base that they like to eat Uh, like your humpback dolphins want to eat only mullet they're like crazy about mullet um it's only if they don't get mullet that they'll go looking for something else so whether that has to do with their dentition whether it's a proximate thing or an ultimate thing as we say in behavioral ecology we don't yet know but but they might they can certainly differentiate between different food bases uh dipani if i may add to that yeah yeah there was a study which did on the uh taste mechanisms of uh, mammals and one of the studies was also on uh, porpoises and whales and it was very interesting that we there were mutations in four of the five taste bud uh, systems for cetaceans and eventually a japanese university if i'm not wrong or a canadian i'm not sure it was i think it was a japanese canadian university they released a paper which said that whales can only taste salt they don't mm. you know taste sweet or spice or umami or bitter they can no. taste only salt and others have become pseudo receptors there was a mutational study that happened in 2014 or 2013 it's quite easy to find that uh, paper i think you just have to put uh, whales salt pseudo receptors you might get that paper so just adding up that yeah thank you thank you uh, bala subramaniam as uh, ma'am just curious have you ever spotted whale sharks in our indian waters Oh yes, we, uh, yes, yes. Uh, for sure, we have some whale sharks in our waters. We have nursery grounds, as you know, where uh, female whale sharks actually come to lay their young pup, lay their pups, give birth to live youngs, and off the coast of Gujarat also. And we have young animals in the Bay of Bengal every year from Orissa. Just last month, I think January, February, we have young ones in Orissa, young ones in Maharashtra and Karnataka. So I myself have also seen whale sharks while doing surveys of the coast of Orissa and of the coast of Goa. Um, so whale sharks, yes, and we are kind of succeeding in recovering their populations. Also, fishermen have been given compensation every time they catch a whale shark to cut the net and to release it um, because of their life history. You know, sharks are they are seen as as fish, but actually they are life history strategies are closer to mammals because they give birth to live young. um most shark species are uh, they both full live young so they don't give birth to uh, hundreds of little fishies like other fish do so uh yes yes to that whale shark 
Okay, that is so cool. I know that there are whale sharks, but the fact that you got to see if some of them, I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> Anupam Ghosh asks, so does each whale have a signature song? I mean, not like the BTS song. I'm talking about the whale song. <laughs> each humpback whale, individual humpback whale, um, probably, yes, does. Bottlenose dolphin has signature whistles, yes. Uh, similar with killer whales, has individual IDs and also sperm whales. Um, they do have, or you can identify an individual based on their vocalization if you have enough of it. We don't have data for all different species. Uh, as I told you, you know, this it's a strange evolution that has happened. There are some species of uh, dolphins that move in hundreds together, you know, and they don't have that kind of social structure that dol bottlenose dolphins and killer whales have, uh, where individual identification or individual identity is important. Uh, that time they are like a school of large fish. So it's it's very interesting. And in those uh, species, it's spinner dolphins, spotted dolphins, striped dolphins that are found in super cords, dusky dolphins, individual identity does not seem to be important. They are moving in oceans which are rich in killer whales. And so they prefer to lose that individual identity. In those cases, we don't have that kind of complex vocalization evolved. Okay, next, uh, two people have asked a question. I'm just going to put it out together. Uh, Saptarshi Sakar from YouTube and Scott Miller from YouTube. Uh, Saptarshi asks, what's the reason for whales washing up on shore? And Scott Miller adds on, I find it fascinating in a morbid kind of way that whales seemingly compulsion to the beach when old or sick. Is it because they are visible or they simply die at sea? So most, uh, so they're called, it's a very beautiful term. It's called whale fall. Uh, when a whale dies, it usually, 80% of the cases, they sink to the bottom of the sea slowly. They do not wash ashore. And so it is a concern when we suddenly have a high number of whales getting stranded at shore. Because it's not normal. It's usually just the currents that probably do this. Um, um, and uh, sometimes when they strand live, then that's because of either sickness or because of injury or because of damage, you know, inner ear damage or something like that. Um, so India, it, it's, it could be seismic surveys that causes damage to their brains or, or, or things like that. Uh, so actually the percentage of actual uh, deaths are much, much higher and the animals sink at sea. Okay. Is that yeah. why this trend is complex? It can be, as I said, natural causes also and it could be anthropogenic causes also. And the oceans are getting much noisier with the number of ships. Yeah, there is yeah. there is noise, there's ships, as I said, in those indirect threats. All those threats are increasing and their habitat qualities are decreasing, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, it is a matter of concern, especially for the near shore cetaceans. Yes. And there are certain times of the years when the blue whales and the boobies whales and the humpback whales come quite close to shore. Uh, so, if you have uh, shipping traffic, like say in Netrani near in Karwar, very soon because of the naval base, it's going to be a big concern because the humpback whales are there too during six months of the year, you know. So, we'll have to start then having marine mammal observers on vessels looking out for the whales and telling the ships not to <laughs> be careful. They have that in Oman already, those kind of programs. Oh, really? They have shipping channels that are not overlapping with the humpback whales. Uh, population movement patterns yeah you have to do that level but that's after they've done satellite tagging of the whales you know you have to have the paths of the whales and then the paths of the shipping channels away from away from them uh, Zeman asked a question uh, ma'am I read somewhere that whales meat has a lot of mercury so isn't it contaminating the ocean Whale meat has a lot of mercury or whale meat tends to collect a lot of mercury from the, uh, it does not, no, it does not leach from its skin into the ocean. If that's what it's from its blubber yeah. into the ocean, it is collected there. It does not leach. Uh, I'll just add on to that. So this is a yeah. concept called bioaccumulation. Bio so there are certain elements that are broken down by the body and some that are not. Mercury is one of those things and whales eat a lot okay and they live for a long amount of time so obviously bioaccumulation is a huge problem for them and we are the humans who have been introducing mercury into the waters for 
years now. So obviously yeah. we are the ones who are providing that element into the water, into those fishes and into the krill, which are being absorbed by the whale and therefore, uh, you know, adding to the bioaccumulation. So if anything, it's us that who are comp- contaminating the ocean, who are contaminating the seas, which is leading to this. So the mercury poisoning is an issue and it's an issue everywhere else. Even if you take a tiny fish, it does have yeah. mercury in it. But because yeah. whales are much bigger, the levels are much bigger. And it's all, unfortunately, I mean, yeah, it's us. So yeah. Just adding to that. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> we have, I think, pretty much a very fun question. Srikant Nayak from YouTube asks, have whales been caught lying when they sing? <laughs> that is such an amazing question. I wish I could find out. Uh, mm-hmm. But I can see... I can certainly see bottlenose dolphins and killer whales lying. They're like us. They're like humans. While humpback whales, I would put in another category. Ravadi dolphins, I would put in another category of people, of beings. Uh, I, I, this is just my hypothesis. But no, they have not been caught lying. They have been caught uh, stealing and strategizing uh, to get the best catch. So bottlenose dolphins are like killer whales. Bottlenose dolphins have alliances and uh, they can gang rape uh, other females. They can do infanticide. They can kill the calf so that the female comes back into estrus. Uh, So they have all these, uh, you know how you see in primates, you see a whole range of primates. Like the ponobers are on one side, you know, and the gorillas on the other. Similar, similar with mammal society. Um, So lying... Probably, but we have not caught it on audio yet. <laughs> so, uh, as Deepani <laughs> earlier said, she, yeah, Deepani earlier said she is scared of bottlenose dolphins. Uh, she's giving us more yes. reasons as to why so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. they are something else altogether. They can recognize each other. They can recognize the I always say that I did not find the they found me in the water. And they come, they look at you and then they leave. You know? The bias in my data, but it is true. Uh, I remember uh, when they I might chose... lose my signal, huh? I'm just warning you. So you might need to take out take over after a bit. Uh, in case I lose my signal. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, we, we heard a bit of things going, so yeah, I realized that. Uh, so uh, the, uh, one of my favorite cartoon shows is uh, The Penguins of Madagascar and they had a series called Dr. Blowhole's Revenge uh, in which the dolphin is the villain and it is so good. If you haven't seen that movie, please do watch. It's frighteningly well done and where this dolphin terrorizes penguins and knowing your, uh, knowing everybody here is getting lots of information about dolphins that they're not the cute, cuddly things they are, I think this will like, feed into the paranoia okay so next question is from rahul uh, who's been asking really uh, very good questions for the last few days um average number of whales per sweep what's the maximum number of whales that you have seen in a day whales no i have seen up to uh, about 300 to 400 dolphins in a day in a large pod you cannot count them 300, 400, 500 together. Just off the coast of uh, Porto Novo, Penangi Patai. One of my best sightings ever in my life uh, in Indian waters is a uh, mixed pod, super pod they're called, of uh, spotted dolphins and spinner dolphins together. Uh, whale themselves. I think we lost her. Was she just kidnapped by a dolphin? We don't know. Uh, no, it's my house, my area. I don't get any signal here. So you might need to take over, Bertie. Uh, I might go off and on like this now. Uh, okay. The, the, the just two more questions and we are done. Let me put both. Um, one is from Jaydeep, yeah. who says, how do yeah. whales see in the dark? Basically yeah. asking about echolocation. And the next question mm. is from... Uh, uh, mm. Rahul again. So, what's happening in the Bay of Bengal? All that you're saying is the Arabian Sea. What's the action on the Arabian Sea? So, these are the two questions. 
प्रॉब्लम इन इन एयर and in your water but uh, at night time they use echolocation it is used as i said to navigate and it is used to uh, look for food so so they will send out uh, sonar not the blue whales not the baleen whales huh? for they don't they don't use echolocation really for uh, looking for food but the dolphins do the cetaceans do the cetaceans have special adaptations in their lower jaw in their melon uh, for uh, getting sound back into their into their inner ear um so um with the baleen whales we still haven't figured out how they even vocalize they don't have in you know they don't have the apparatus for it uh but um, like whales seem to be making such loud songs uh, so we are still trying to figure out the hearing the ring ability and the sound producing mechanism in the species uh, would you know more the, more about this um uh, not particularly not Other i don't the I, i'll stuff. be on this yeah. i'll be on the same as you yeah same plane as you yeah well we will what's find what's the other question i forgot already a uh, second one is bay of bengal what's available yeah. what's happening on the bay of bengal yes so we have done loads of research of the coast of orissa and the nicobar islands and tamil nadu and uh, uh, so the uh, most of those species that you saw on those poster are also found on this side on along the east coast of india the east coast of india is different from the west coast in the sense that the bathymetry if you look on west coast is the the continental shelf is much wider and it's much shallower when you go from out at sea from land while on the east coast there's deep water very fast so on, the what is different is the species assemblage is different the species you will find your spinner dolphins and your spotted dolphins and your bottlenose dolphins much faster than you will find humpback dolphins and finless porpoises while on the west coast you have first humpback dolphins and finless porpoises so uh, habitat related differences is, are there in the species that are found but otherwise very similar uh, but on the west on the east coast you don't have humpback whales at all you have you have sperm whales you start off with a blue whales but no humpback whales for whatever reason humpback whales are only in the arabian sea and then south of sri lanka going towards australia they have um, not come up to the bay of bengal i have read about something called bright mm-hmm. whale b r y d e s whale broody yeah bright or broody yes, yes. they are there also both sides i whichever yeah both sides they are the most common baleen whale uh, the bright whale you will see them if you go off the coast of cochin in one of those ships that go to lakshadweep they ride right yeah. there in the shipping channel oh fantastic yeah yeah okay, so Dipani, yeah so that... if you go to the database on marine mammals.in and uh, look marine for mammals. like data for tamil nadu or look for data yeah then you'll be able to download all the species that have been reported from from that side also Okay. Yeah. So marine mammals. Okay. Dot in. So that actually brings us to the end of. Okay, I just can't say so much. Ah, so that brings us to the end. Uh, we have gone through all the questions. All that remains for me to say is, thank you so much, Dipani. Looks like our adventure did work. It's eight twenty, and you are. Thank you. Home. Thank you. Safe and sound. Hopefully. Yes, I'm home. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. So thank you so much for taking your time <laughs> off and doing this. a uh, tight a uh, very well scheduled talk it was very informative very engaging i had i personally i, I had such a wonderful time and i'm pretty sure the participants did as well uh, thank you to all the participants thank you. who were there and asking all the interesting questions and those on youtube also thank you for being there and asking questions uh this is the penultimate talk of cosmic zoom uh let's just go to the events there you go and we have just one more talk left and that is tomorrow at 7 pm where we have cosmology from big bang to the present day by professor tirthankar roy choudhury uh, and we have a special guest moderator professor rajesh gopakumar himself 
will be moderating and asking the questions and will be taking care of this session along with our man Anupam Ghosh as well. Um, <laughs> this is my last interaction with the events. It has been an absolute honor and a privilege to do so. Uh, thank you to all those people. Uh, Dipani, you can't see the chat, but there are lots of people saying thank you. Thank you for the wonderful Thank you talk. so thank much. You. I'm writing yeah. this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it's been an absolute pleasure hosting this and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking uh, to Dipani and learning so much as well. And I'm pretty sure there's lots more left. I'm yeah. sure there's lots more that she was not able. I know for a fact there are about 30 more slides which she has <laughs> shown us. Um, so probably another day, another time, we could uh, take this forward. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have missed any of the talk, you can go to the website right now you can click on youtube and you can go through the chat uh, you can go through the talk if you're watching this later uh, oh there we have more of our non-human friends hello the proofs are there. Hi. <laughs> so we're really glad to see this so thanks once again to everybody okay, who's attended good night good bye night bye. Dipani. thank you everybody bye. have good a night. lovely evening uh, it all that remains for me to say is that uh, tomorrow's the last session but the mediator guided sessions at 10 30 a.m are still going on for a few more days keep a watch out so come register yourself to cosmic cosmic zoom group register i think no cosmic zoom tour register and you can take part in the 10 30 a.m where we have super enthusiastic mediators who take you through a tour of the website so that's what is there please check it out check it out on all our in on our, all our social media profiles Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're all Cosmic Zoom on everything. At Zoom Cosmic on Twitter. Uh, please do look at the website. There's lots more in, uh, information there, especially the Wales region, which is what you're here for. So that's me, and that's me, Bertie, actually saying thank you. Special shout out to the AV team, uh, to Anupam, to Ajit for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to do this. Uh, this is the last hosting session for me. So let me also say this has been an amazing few days the last two weeks have been amazing i've met lots of amazing people uh, the mediators especially i'm enjoying the the amazing uh, banter the science talk we've been having uh, it this kind of gives me the hope and joy of knowing that the next generation of scientists and researchers are on top of their game and are as enthusiastic and as happy about science as i know the top scientists are so I'm looking forward to more things coming our way. Keep a lookout. Bash will be back. Remember, Cosmic Zoom is about one theme called Scales. We have more than four, five themes waiting. And they're all going to come out eventually in Bash. And eventually we'll have a big physical uh, exhibition. Fingers crossed. Soon enough, we meet everybody. Uh, till then, let's just keep going virtually forward and sharing the science with everyone. So this is me, Bertie, actually saying thank you to all of you. Have a good evening. Have a good night. And keep signing. Bye. Kobe, sir, we can stop. Yeah, sure. sure. Participants, you may leave if you wish. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jaydeep. Thank you, Zenith. Are the participants still there? We have only eight, two and all. Nice song, Bertie. Nice choice. Thanks, Anupam. Thanks. <laughs> Zero is still there. Yeah, it, this was a good talk. I mean.